Welcome to Big Ideas Small Business TV. I'm Doreen Milano, and my guest today is Chris Wallace, the CEO of the North Texas Commission. Our discussion is going to be about how North Texas is winning or losing in Austin. You're tuned in to Big Ideas Small Business with Doreen Milano. Doreen brings energy, focus, and creativity with the most cutting-edge tools and systems needed to grow business, drive profits, and achieve dreams. Ready to rise? Here's your host, Doreen Milano. The North Texas Commission was founded 50 years ago to help develop the building of DFW Airport. The original founders realized that there was an even greater potential for our region and a need to unify all the stakeholders. The NTC is a public-private partnership that drives large, impactful projects and the legislative issues benefiting the 13 counties of North Texas. The three pillars of service are advocate, educate, and collaborate. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. It's great to be here. I am so excited you're here. We have a few subjects that I wanted to just touch on. You bet. There are issues for all small businesses here in the 13 counties logistics and supply chain, inflation, employment, taxes, electrical reliability, where do we start? Yeah. We do have a lot of challenges. Uh, you know, we are blessed to live in a great state and certainly in a great vibrant region. Uh, and we made some great strides in this last legislative session and with an unprecedented three special sessions and maybe a fourth one coming up, some say, uh, uh, here in a month or so. Wow. And so, uh, you know, while we um, have some challenges uh, uh, yet to be addressed, uh, we uh, uh, have some great successes as well. So, employment and our ability to get employees to go to work you bet. and stay at work yeah. is something I've heard from every small business I've talked to. Yeah. That's the magic question is, you know, due to an unprecedented uh, public pandemic um, that nobody could, you know, really foresee, uh, you know, a lot of companies scaled back, right? Uh, they had to lay off workforce. Uh, so you have a lot of the uh, employees uh, that were perhaps, let's just take the service industry, right? Right. Uh, Which was they were in the service industry, things are going problem. well. Uh, the service industry, the production decreased, many closed. Uh, thankfully, a lot are recovering now, mm -hmm. uh, but it took several, several months, you know, for us to get there. Uh, but in the meantime, those employees went elsewhere. They uh, upskilled, they reskilled, uh, they went into another industry. Uh, they may be uh, working for Amazon and other uh, 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 shippers and suppliers, uh, manufacturers, and what have you, where. Um, you know, it's a good for them. Uh, and those industries thrived during the pandemic. Uh, but then now the service industry is trying to uh, re revamp and they're trying to bring back employees. Uh, and so it's been uh, very hard not only to be able to uh, recruit employees, uh, but it's also been very hard for them to ramp up training. You know, you look at our airline industry. Uh, you, know, you know, production was way down in terms of, of you know, service. Um, uh, capacities and what have you, and uh, they are having to not only recruit employees, but they're having to recruit new employees who have to go through training, clearance, et cetera. So it's going to take us some time for many of those most stressed industries during the pandemic to realize their full potential, uh, but we're well on our way. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, uh, in the region, about a four and a half percent unemployment rate. Uh, so we're getting back to pre-pandemic levels. The states have been around 5.6 or so um, unemployment rate today. And so, um, uh, again, not, not near as high as what we saw during the pandemic. And so Texas compared to other states, certainly the North Texas region in Texas, uh, we are recovering at a faster, more rapid, successful rate than uh, many other places around the country. That's great news. It is great news, but we still have a lot of challenges, right? And small businesses uh, certainly are seeing that. Uh, I think uh, most will say today that they're slowly recovering. Uh, and we're going to keep a close eye on that. Uh, make sure, particularly from our standpoint, that if there's legislation that needs to be uh, uh, introduced, 
that we work with one of our 41 House members and nine senators from North Texas, from our 13 counties, uh, work with leadership in Austin to make sure that um, issues are being addressed to further uh, stimulate the, the Texas economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, the stimulus that the federal government has provided. And our 13 members of Congress from our region, plus Senator Cornyn and Cruz, we have 15 who represent North Texas, and two, of course, senators who represent the entire state. We work very closely with them to make sure that uh, the prior stimulus dollars and the current and what will be in the future uh, goes to directly benefit um, everybody, but particularly small business. Well, 90% of all business is small business. Indeed. Right? Indeed. And, you know, a lot of uh, large corporations uh, want to see the success of small business. They're vendors, they're suppliers. Absolutely. And so uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So it's, you know, small business is defined as nine employees or less. Right. Right? And when we look at small and micro business, the micro businesses, from my perspective, took more of a hit than the smaller businesses do. Yeah. And when those businesses are trying desperately to get their market share back and, and mm -hmm. do the things that they need to do, and it didn't help that during this time, marketing and effective marketing completely changed. Right. Yeah, how we do time. business. Uh, how we do business changed. You bet. And so is any of that actually being addressed uh, not not so much in terms of from a legislative standpoint, from our perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and what we do day in and day out. Uh, but I think overall, uh, I think uh, uh, business businesses in general are having to relook in terms of how they market, uh, how they communicate to their customer, their client base. Yeah. Uh, what is the return on investment? Uh, we look at that in our own organization, our stakeholders. What is the return on investment? How how frequent? How often? Uh, what is the quality of communication to them to make sure that they're you know, receiving that uh, positive ROI, uh, just like any business. I think that's, that's a really big deal. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I've seen is that our focus has gone from just marketing to talking to specific people and having that specific conversation. Absolutely. And when we talk about having a specific conversation, right? It's really important for, I think, the larger audience mm -hmm. to understand NTC and how it facilitates that, that conversation. Yeah. No, and we would welcome that. You know, um, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, we have a long history. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We're very proud of that. Uh, but the- Which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah indeed. That uh, is really uh, wonderful. You. Uh, it's been a great year for us, despite the challenges. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, we are unique. Uh, the commission, uh, as you mentioned, a public-private partnership. We, we are made up of about 60% of the larger to mid-sized employers of the region. Uh, so to benefit the business community, including small business, uh, and then 40% of the public sector. So it's really unique when you have an organization that is bringing public sector leaders together with private sector leaders to uh, address and to solve challenges of a defined 13-county region. And we do that a lot through our legislative advocacy in Austin and in D.C. We have a great team. Uh, then that's a, probably about 75 to 80 percent of what we do. Uh, uh, the other 15 to 20 percent would be workforce development from an overarching standpoint. Mm -hmm to make sure that we are connecting business with community colleges and business with four years, making sure that our K through 12 curriculum, et cetera, working with leadership to make sure that we are addressing a high skilled workforce pipeline, uh, which is, you know, continues to be, even prior to the pandemic, uh, continues to be Texas and our, certainly our region's number one challenge today. So uh, it truly is a unique partnership. We, we think there's about five to six other type of organizations like ours around the country. Uh, some of those are involved uh, directly in economic development deal making. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not involved in that space. We're on the policy side and certainly help provide tools to those who are recruiting <clears throat> and retaining business, expanding business here, uh, marketing tools and what have you. But uh, we're mainly on the policy side and we 
certainly enjoy what we do, and we're thankful that the region is so supportive. Uh, uh, you mentioned the importance of unifying our region. Yes. You know, we, we compete. Uh, we compete with Houston. We compete with other regions around the entire country for business. So we have to make sure that our environment is conducive to business, uh, that our regulation is conducive to business. And luckily, we do have a state that is conducive to business, our policies, our regulatory climate compared to other states, which is why you're seeing the number of corporate relocations come to Texas. Uh, Especially more than from any California. Other state. Absolutely. Because of the high regulatory environment in California, people want to escape that, come to a state that is more conducive to business. Now, our goal is, is we've got to maintain that. We have to maintain that. And we have to balance that in terms of the regulatory, even some of the more social issues uh, that businesses kind of tend to, to shy away from, uh, which is reason, one reason why they may not be moving here. So we have to address those and make sure that our policies are fair. Uh, and we try to be a little bit more in what I call the sensible center and not your far right or far left from mm -hmm. the political spectrum, uh, because that's where business wants to be. They want to be in a, uh, uh, a, uh, an environment that there's not a lot of uncertainty uh, they want a predictable environment for a safe They want to know that they can keep doing business right. no matter what comes down the pike. Indeed, and that their you investment know, is safe. We have all Absolutely. kinds of things that are happening all the, all the time, and they need to understand that Texas has created, I don't want to say a cocoon, but a, a safe space for them to be. Well said, indeed. So let's, let's continue this in just a moment. Sure. We'll be right back, and you are listening to Big Ideas Small Business TV. I'm Doreen Milano, and we'll be back in a moment. A polished look says a lot about you. In under three seconds, that first impression can open and close doors. Jepreve. Jepreve has the brands you love to wear. Style & Company, Pistola, Aiden, Vince Camuto, and more. 165 labels with fit that flatters. Jepreve.com. Jepreve ships from Farmers Branch, Texas. Ask us about local DFW fashion shows that bring Jepreve right to you. Upscale fashion doesn't have to be expensive, and you don't have to dig through racks of clothes that end up damaged and missing buttons from being tried on over and over and over again. Jabrieve.com is your answer to fine clothing in casual, career, and formal wear. Make a name for yourself. Do it in style. Jabrieve. Jabrieve.com. Name brand apparel without the department store prices. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. The Epic Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interests, and we never will be. The Epic Times is a non-partisan media. That means we don't stand for any political party. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit, a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Business runs on technology and human beings are creatures of habit. Unfortunately, not all our habits are good. Technology, when it works, is supposed to make our lives easier, creating routines that allow us to protect customer data, track our progress, forecast the future, communicate better, and move much faster. So you need technology solutions that work when you're not working or simply not paying attention. Smart technology solutions, making the complicated uncomplicated.
And we're back. You're listening to Big Ideas Small Business TV, and I'm your host, Doreen Milano, and we're talking with Chris Wallace with the North Texas Commission. And it's a public-private partnership, and you are going to tell us more about what a private-public partnership is yeah, you bet. and how we can get involved. You bet. Yeah, the commission uh, is a 501c6 nonprofit organization. We're an association of private sector businesses, any business, and uh, the public sector. So our counties, our cities, our school districts, uh, our higher education institutions, four year and two years. Um, and we come together to um, address the region's greatest challenges. And a lot of that is through the legislative lens, right? So uh, working with our legislators in Austin and in D.C. to solve state and federal policy issues that benefit business, that benefit the public sector as well. You know what's really cool about our, our organization is that you have the public sector that is going to bat for the private sector leaders, and you have the private sector leaders in terms of a couple examples this last session that were going to bat for the um, uh, uh, you know, the public uh, going about for the private sector leaders. And so both working together uh, truly is unique. Some, some kind of compare us to a chamber of commerce, regional chamber of commerce. Uh, that's a fairly good comparison the way that the membership structure is. Okay. Uh, businesses can join, uh, but also public sector can join. You don't see a lot of chambers there. Uh, mainly involved in business issues, right? Correct. They're not involved in public sector issues. So we're a bit, we're a bit unique as an association, a membership-based association that we are uh, uh, engaged in the public and and the private. So uh, uh, it's uh, uh, very unique organizations. Uh, the most unique most unique organization that I've served. Uh, we you know we work very closely. I mentioned chambers. We work very closely with our chambers of commerce. Uh, we manage a unified strategy for the region called a regional chamber coalition. Uh, there are 102 chambers of commerce in our 13 county areas, and nine of them have government relations functions, either in-house or they contract out, or both. Uh, and because that's about 80% of what we do is uh, lobby, uh, we're involved in the public policy space, uh, those nine, we stay very close to those nine, all of them, but particularly those nine, and we divide and conquer issues. So whether it be, I uh, pulled a few up here, whether it's uh, economic recovery issues, whether it is um, um, uh, recapturing Medicaid, uh, local control, higher education funding, K-12 through funding, infrastructure, mental health, the list goes on. These were issues of the last legislative session and a few of the special sessions. Um, what we do is we divide and conquer in our chambers. Each of those nine chambers will take one or two of these issues. We'll take a couple of the issues, and then we help manage that. So there's not duplication, and there's a consistent messaging to our legislators about what the priorities are for the region. So in a nutshell, you've got public and private sector leaders coming together to set the legislative priorities, and they vote on those, of the region. And then it's our job to with these different coalitions of the chambers and cities and counties and, and businesses to go to Austin and to uh, fight for what's good for North Texas. Make sure that we get our fair share of uh, money, allocations. Absolutely. Our fair share of uh, appointments to boards and commissions, to agencies. Uh, so it truly is a, a, a really unique organization that uh, we should be very proud of. Um, I know we are we're proud to be employed there, for sure, my team and I. When we talk about some of the bigger issues that are happening in North Texas, and I think this is this particular issue is a nationwide issue, it's mental health. Mm -hmm. Because mental health took a real hit during this pandemic, Indeed. and it is a very slow recovery for that specific item. How has the North Texas Commission and the surrounding chambers of commerce addressed the needs of mental health. Mental health, yeah. You know, we saw uh, probably uh, the most success that we've seen in the state in the last several sessions. We saw the most success during this last general session and really the third special session. Um, I, I pulled up some numbers here during the break. Of the uh, American uh, uh, Rescue Act, 
uh, the appropriations, um, we got uh, 13.3 billion. Um, That's huge. It is huge for Texas. Uh, and thanks to the leadership of Chairwoman Jane Nelson, uh, one of our great state senators, she just announced her retirement. She will not be running again. Uh, but she really championed 238 million of that to go to a mental uh, and behavioral health hospital in Dallas. So our region does not have a facility like that today. And so it's long overdue, uh, as you kind of alluded to, and so we are, we are proud that our region will be served by such facility and dollars have been allocated uh, by the state legislature, dollars from the federal government that our members of Congress all helped to, to achieve and of that 13.3 billion, 238 million will go to that mental health facility. And then you've got other organizations like uh, Metro Care, uh, Dr. John Burris and others, uh, uh, mental health providers who do excellent work throughout the entire region who are undergoing their own private uh, 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 capital raising campaigns, right. which I encourage people to support. So again, it's a public private uh, type of partnership collaboration where you have public tax dollars and private, uh, you know, philanthropic funding. corporate funding uh, to actually go in to, to address this issue. Uh, but it's very real, as you pointed out. And it's, it's something that, uh, uh, thankfully, Governor Abbott has been pushing for years that we have to tackle mental health. And uh, I think we finally saw some great strides uh, in, the, in, the, in the really the third special session. That is a, an amazing accomplishment. It is. From my perspective. It is. And I know that there, within the small business here in Texas, they're dealing with people who are drug abusers in the family. They have aging, aging parents that they're having to deal with. They're having to deal with um, drug abuse, aging parents, and mental health. It and is a real challenge. It is a challenge. And in one of my interviews, um, Lee Richardson, who um, is the director of the Brain Performance Center, mm -hmm. and I had a discussion. And because of some of the issues that we all face during the pandemic, it is highly likely that there's a large percentage of the po population that is dealing with post-traumatic stress. Right. Not that it's gotten to the point of disorder yet, but we are having some of the classic symptoms. Yeah. We're angry. We don't know, you know, we're having a hard time planning. We can't get beyond certain things. And recognizing that those are issues and you need to have support to get through those things, it's an important issue that I believe is one of the things that's holding back. Indeed. Indeed, and it, and it does impact the We're workforce. Texas. It does impact businesses yeah. with their workforce having those issues. It impacts families and uh, the whole spectrum, no doubt. So I'm glad that we made some great strides there. That's amazing. Uh, now, that's not uh, perfect. You know, it's we, not we, done we, and over. Not, not at all, and we have a lot of work to do, but, but uh, the legislature made some great strides there. So what's on the, what's on the horizon? You know, um, uh, we, uh, uh, broadband uh, was a big issue, uh, obviously an, an issue prior to uh, the pandemic and the winter storm, uh, but escalated uh, because of those uh, circumstances. Uh, but the legislature also made some great strides there. Uh, now the implementation of the allocation of those dollars from the state and from the federal government. Uh, broadband is key, uh, again, of that 13.3 billion uh, there was 500.5 million for broadband expansion just from the ARPA funds, plus with the legislature and what they've done to set up a process to be able to accept to 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 uh, accept more federal funding uh, through the comptroller's office. So now we have a broadband office for the state that's through the comptroller's wow. uh, leadership and management, and we'll be able to accept more and more federal dollars in the recent infrastructure act that Congress passed. Um, we'll be receiving about 38 billion as a state. Uh, so hopefully a third or more will come to North Texas and there are some broadband dollars in that as well. So, uh, you know, the good news is there are significant allocations. 
the challenge now is make sure that we use that money wisely, that we use it, and there is a good return on investment of public tax dollars, that we put that money to work. And we put that money to work that's going to impact small businesses included. Wonderful news. Indeed. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, I want to take a short amount of time and talk about the infrastructure for electricity, because we're tired of being in the dark, right? So we'll be right back. This is Doreen Milano with Big Ideas Small Business TV, and we're going to listen to our sponsors for just a moment. Business runs on technology, and human beings are creatures of habit. Unfortunately, not all our habits are good. Technology, when it works, is supposed to make our lives easier, creating routines that allow us to protect customer data, track our progress, forecast the future, communicate better, and move much faster. So you need technology solutions that work when you're not working or simply not paying attention. Smart technology solutions, making the complicated uncomplicated. Welcome back. And are you starting to realize how you need to be involved in these discussions? The next question I have for Chris is, how are we addressing the electrical infrastructure yeah. so that Snowmageddon is not a regular thing that happens around here? Indeed. Well, thankfully, the predictions are uh, that we're going to have a fairly mild winter. Uh, we'll keep hearing that. Uh, and of course, we're kind of counting on that, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the the governor uh, just recently, the head of the PUC, uh, in great leadership over at um, ERCOT, have all promised now or in and publicly said that the lights will stay on. Um, you know what we worry about are maybe some uh, 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 areas, some rolling blackouts and what have you, depending on weather. But uh, hopefully, we'll have a mild winter. Uh, you know the criteria. Uh, that was established by legislation, uh, from what I understand from the agency standpoint, uh, was not rolled out, was not developed uh, as comprehensive as it could have been in time. And so I think what you have now is you have providers that are scrambling to make sure uh, that the weatherization uh, is there that was required. But how they do that uh, and the, the criteria of what that scope looks like uh, was late coming. And so it really places a strain on them today. Uh, let me just, just to make sure we're all clear. So SB3 passed, Senate Bill 3 passed. Uh, many of our uh, region's legislators are very engaged with it, thankfully. Uh, basically, it will provide reforms and oversight of our power grid in our state. Um, it requires weather, uh, weatherization of, uh, of, of facilities over time. Uh, it establishes rules for regulating rolling blackouts, which are necessary uh, to keep the grid up and running. Uh, and it increases fines for those facilities and companies that are not prepared, uh, which is what they're dealing with now. Uh, expands the number of PUC members. Uh, and there's a lot of um, discussion about governance of the PUC in ERICOT. Uh, the ERCOT board went uh, from 16 to 11. Uh, there's now um, greater legislative oversight from what we understand. Uh, they establish a whole uh, upgraded communication system uh, to alert citizens statewide on mapping critical customers that cannot lose power. So, you know, all this being said, uh, uh, there is still uh, capacity concerns uh, I think among business people, among residents, 
Um, and uh, thankfully, I think we'll have a mild winter. We won't have issues, but uh, all that being said, I don't think we're quite there the way we should be uh, yet. Uh, but some great strides were made in legislation and allocations and regulatory to make sure that something like uh, we saw in winter storm Uri does not happen again. Now, so are there will tell you that. So board members, <coughs> Excuse me. residents of Texas? They are. They are. Uh, what I understand, the ERCOT, uh, uh, our, our leadership pretty much did away with those that were not residents of Texas. Now, you know, to me, uh, uh, you know, people serve on different boards because they have Capacity. areas of expertise, Yeah. right? I mean, you want to bring the brightest and the best, uh, and the best, no matter to me where they live, right? Uh, uh, but, you know, they need to have skin in the game. And certainly, you know, we should look uh, within our state first to make sure that we have the brightest and the best, which probably we do. Uh, and uh, it's been proven over time and time again. So a lot of those governance issues of uh, who the board members should be, the expertise, where they live geographically, uh, a lot of those governance issues were, uh, were addressed. Uh, but, you know, a lot of time was spent on that. And where we want more time to be spent is to make sure that we have the capacity, to make sure that mm -hmm. providers have the rules and the criteria on what weatherization should look like. Uh, and, you know, uh, at the end of the day, who pays for it? Uh, because uh, those those it's the residents and businesses of indeed, North Texas it's going to be passed on to those who use it right the that's users. right so it's a business and they are their business Absolutely. companies and they they have to realize to their own shareholder just like we do in our businesses that that there's a return on investment so well Chris I cannot thank you enough thanks for having me it has been a real education and how can we reach you you bet. Uh, on the website, uh, uh, ntc-dfw.org, uh, you can just Google our being North Texas Commission. Uh, we're there. Uh, we'd love to have. And that's uh, where we can go join the North Texas Commission. Indeed. indeed yeah. No, we would love to talk to uh, any business and public sector as well. We're always trying to get more and more uh, people to the table to be engaged in our region's uh, legislative priorities. We're already planning now for a very busy interim. You know, we really didn't have an interim because of COVID. Right. Uh, and we're going to have a very, binner, uh, very busy interim session come January through all of uh, 2022. And then uh, January of 2023 will be our 88th session. And it's going to be, uh, uh, again, we want to make sure that, um, that we have a uh, session that is pro-business, uh, pro-local control, and pro-public schools. Uh, those are our three really points of criteria that we're really focused on. So, so if we're having issues and we want to have our voice heard around education, please come see around us. business, absolutely around um, policies. Indeed, and uh, another great avenue because you know we're a big region. Uh, 7.6 million people. Uh, by the way, if, if your viewers are not aware, um, we are bigger in North Texas with 7.6 million people than 38 other states in the U.S. It's pretty overwhelming. If you look at our population boom compared to 38 other states individually, we are, we are, we are bigger right here in North Texas. So that, so that being said, always encourage businesses, particularly small business, to join their local chamber of commerce. These local chambers do great work throughout our region, throughout our state, and they are engaged in the legislative process as well. If they're not, we're helping them become engaged at the North Texas Commission. So join your local chamber of commerce too, uh, and um, we'd love to have businesses and public sector leaders at the, uh, at the commission. Chris, it's absolutely been a pleasure. I've known you for a number of years, yes. and we've never had a conversation that wasn't boring. Indeed. It's always been exciting. Thank you. So special thanks to the OBBM Network, Grace Point Media, Office Furniture Source, and our sponsors. I'm Doreen Milano, and I'm here to make your business rock solid and profitable. You can reach me at capital V, number two, e.biz, v2e.biz, or call me at 650-483-5798. Have a blessed day. Thank you. The fact is, business has changed. Engagement has changed. And for us to recover our businesses and our communities, 
we have to engage differently. If you want to have a serious conversation about engagement, community, and your business, call me, Doreen Milano, Visions to Excellence. I'm an executive coach. You can reach me at 650-483-5798 or contact me online at v2e.biz. That's capital V, number two, E, dot biz. Let's have a conversation. This has been Big Ideas Small Business with Doreen Milano. Doreen Milano solves problems for small and mid-market family-owned businesses and service-based industries. To work with Doreen, go to v2e.biz. For guest and sponsorship information, call 650-483-5798. Big Ideas Small Business with Doreen Milano is produced by Offbeat Business Media for the OBBM Network. For OBBM Network programming information, call 214-714-0495. Unauthorized use of any part of Big Ideas Small Business with Doreen Milano without prior permission through the OBBM network is strictly prohibited.